rich aviation tycoon and his family are gunned down in their house. As soon as we heard triple, it was like, oh my God, we never get triples. I mean, that's unheard of. The sole survivor of the family becomes the prime suspect. Now, you can't convict a person for not crying at a funeral, but still, you can get some pretty good ideas. Something's wrong. A three-year cat and mouse game between police and their suspect. We knew Dana was dirty for this. We knew it. This always struck me as the last of the 80s yuppie greed murders. The Billionaire Boys Club, the Menendez Brothers. This was of that ilk. Three seemingly senseless murders, a rich, arrogant kid, and a cop who wouldn't give up. Tonight, on Power, Privilege, and Justice. Easter Sunday, 1992. Millionaire Dale Ewell flew his twin-engine beach craft from Pajaro Dunes on the California coast to his home in Fresno. Ewell had made millions in the aviation business in Central California. Today, he was flying home to meet his wife Glee and daughter Tiffany, who had driven to Fresno ahead of him. Two days later at 9 a.m., the maid arrived at the Yule home. She knocked at the door and got no answer. When she opened the door with her key, two things struck her as odd. The alarm didn't buzz, and the door to the kitchen, always open, was closed. Once inside, she found the bodies of Dale Yule, his wife and daughter. Within minutes, the Fresno County Sheriff's Homicide Unit was racing to the scene. I remember walking up the front steps in the front door and just peering around the corner towards the kitchen where you could see um, Tiffany's body. And when I saw that, I just backed back out. In the hallway was a, uh, a large gentleman that turned out to be Dale Yule in a pool of uh, dry blood, which right away tells you that it's they've been there for a period of time. He was right at the door where Glee was. Detective Sousa had spent years in the robbery division, and the Yule murders didn't look like a burglary to him. There was no forced entry. They had an elaborate alarm system that did not activate. We proved that it was, it was uh, functional. The house had been ransacked, but the burglars had taken very little that was valuable. Detectives were baffled. The murders looked like a targeted hit something that would happen in a bigger city, not in sleepy Fresno. Not a lot happens in Fresno, frankly. The Yule murder was big news, and everyone had a theory. It was the mob. It was Dale's business rivals. It was a burglary gone bad. But the cops knew better. They focused in on the one person who stood to gain the most from the family's $8 million fortune the Yule son, Dana. In this type of a homicide, of course, the sole survivor or sole survivors, they're the ones that are gonna benefit the most, therefore they're the ones you gotta eliminate first. So we are also investigating Dana. 21-year-old Dana Yule was a flashy dresser, notorious for flaunting his wealth. Those who knew him said he was brilliant but arrogant and obsessed with being rich, even richer than his father. Dana wanted to be a businessman. Dana wanted to be rich. Dana was rich. I mean, his family was rich. He wanted for nothing. Dana wanted to be a big shot. But there didn't seem to be any way that Dana could have done it. He had an airtight alibi. On Easter Sunday, while the crime was being committed, Dana was with his girlfriend and her father, an FBI agent. To the detectives, it seemed like an impossible riddle. The one man with motive had no opportunity. Detective Souza was about to begin a game of cat and mouse with Dana Yule that would last three years. On the one side, an arrogant, rich kid who thought he was smarter than anyone else. On the other, a blue-collar cop determined to solve a murder. 
Dale Ewell was born in rural Ohio in the midst of the Great Depression. His father was a farmer who expected his children to earn their keep. We didn't live poorly. We had plenty to eat. We lived with luxuries for a few. The farm was hard work. At the age of 18, Dale left the farm and enrolled in Miami University in Ohio. He graduated with a degree in aeronautical engineering and then joined the Air Force, quickly becoming an expert pilot. When assigned to a base in Phoenix in 1957, Dale met Glee Mitchell, an heiress to an Oklahoma oil fortune. And you're like soulmates. Even though there are different personalities, he was quiet, somewhat reserved. She was very outgoing, very socially active. Dale and Glee married in 1961 and moved to California, where Dale landed his dream job, selling planes to area farmers. Fly right into the farmer's fields, and it would offer free lessons. You buy, I'll teach you how to fly. And it was a natural market for him, the farmers, and he did extremely well at it. In just a few years, Dale had his own dealership. His fierce ambition made him rich, but his hard driving style caused resentment. Dale was a hard man to work for. He was very um, business focused, very money focused. I've seen him be mean to clients. Dale was a very ruthless business person. Honest, but he was out for himself. And he really passed that down to his son. People have misunderstood Dale. They called him ruthless and mean or hard, but he was a uh, fair-minded, tough businessman, no question about it. But what Dale lacked in charm, he made up in cash, lots of cash. He poured his money into local agriculture, and as real estate went up, Dale's fortune grew. Did very, very well, he was very, very shrewd. One time I asked him, I said, Dale, what do you do at night for fun? He says, I read my bank books. In 1967, the Ewells had a daughter, Tiffany, and four years later, a son, Dana, was born. Dale Ewell made sure that Dana and Tiffany had everything that money could buy. He swore his children would never have to struggle the way he had. He was going to give them everything he didn't have and everything he thought they should have. He was a hardworking man, a man who was very successful, who also wanted his son to be very successful, make his own way, although with a great deal of help. Despite their wealth, the Ewells lived modestly. The family in general did not wear fancy clothes or expensive jewelry, and for the most part, they looked like a middle-class family, except for Dana Ewell. Dana really loved money, and he did like showing it off. People just have a natural tendency to want more. The difference isn't that he wanted more, it's how much more he wanted and what he's willing to do to get it. Dale Ewell had made the mistake of passing on money to his son without passing on his belief in hard work. Both the father and the son were driven men, but Dana wanted the money without having to do anything for it. I've seen this story a hundred times. It always ends badly. Dana had no history of violence, but he had plenty of motive. There was about seven to eight million motives in the seven to eight million dollar estate. And clearly Dana Ewell had a very, very strong interest in money. Dana, somewhere along the line, developed an early love for money. He must have equated money with power. Dana wanted people to look up to him, to envy him, because he was rich. In high school, his classmates say he used to pass out hundred dollar bills in the cafeteria. A hundred dollars buys a lot of macaroni and cheese. And he gave a pretty big allowance. I think he's getting like five or 600 a month in high school. For a 16, 17 year old kid, that's a fair amount of money. Dana also had advantages that his father's money couldn't buy. He was smart and handsome, but despite his wealth and looks, Dana had few friends at San Joaquin Memorial High School. He's a brilliant, smart, 180 IQ, too smart for reality. He just didn't fit in. Fiercely competitive, Dana had to be the best at everything. Dana had to have not just an A, he had to have the highest A. He wasn't satisfied unless he had the top score in the class. In his senior year, Dana was voted most likely to succeed. And for Dana, success meant money. I'm gonna make a million, I'm gonna make a billion. I'm gonna be rich. 
And that was what Dana said time and time again. In 1989, Dana enrolled in the honors program at Santa Clara University, majoring in finance. Dana's obsession with being rich in his own right grew. He came to class dressed in Armani suits and silk ties and drove to campus in a gold Mercedes Benz. Dana's grades were good, but he resented having to work for them. During his sophomore year, he plagiarized a classmate's paper in a business ethics class. The professor gave him an F. When most students get an F, they gripe, not Dana. He wrote the professor a six-page, single-spaced, typewritten letter, which began as an explanation and quickly turned into something else entirely. Dana wrote, I have all sorts of strange thoughts lately. I see movies about serial killers, about highly immoral men, and what psychologically stressed people do. I don't want to do anything else wrong. The professor found the letter a little disturbing. Wouldn't you? Dana's father seemed unaware of the violence lurking beneath the surface. When Dana got in trouble, Dale would cover for him, like the time he wrecked his brand new Mercedes. Dale Yule took responsibility for the accident and then had the car replaced with an exact model. I don't think Dale did it for Dana, I think Dale did it for Dale, to protect himself. Why is Dana driving that car now? What happened to his Mercedes? He didn't want these questions asked. And he knew how to stop people asking questions. Dana's closest friend at Santa Clara was a quiet, insecure loner named Joel Radisich. Joel was a computer whiz and fellow business major who lived down the hall from Dana. We referred to him as the odd couple. Dana was this real preppy, clean cut kind of guy. And Joel was a slob, you know, skateboard, never looked kempt. Joel grew up in the West Hills area of Los Angeles the youngest son in a family of seven children, where money was always tight. Dana would come to control and manipulate Joel with astonishing ease. As for his relationship with women, Dana was drawn to a certain type. Dana Yule seemed to like the uh, girls or women that were, were very flashy. But during his junior year, he started dating a very different woman. Monica Zent had grown up in a middle-class home in Morgan Hill a suburb of San Francisco, the daughter of an FBI agent. Monica's aunt was more meek and mild than conservative. Joel and Monica weren't enough. Dana wanted the world to think he was successful and important. He lied to a reporter from a major paper, claiming that he was a self-made millionaire who owned a profitable aircraft distributorship. The article went to print. His father just went ballistic when he read what Dana was saying he had done, because many of the things that Dana claimed to have done, his father actually had done. Dale reacted to this news article as being a slap in the face, a total destruction of his belief in his son. The only thing we can guess is that Dale gave Dana an ultimatum that will support you to end the school and you're on your own, you're out. In the spring of 1992, Dana and Monica decided that the upcoming Easter weekend was the perfect opportunity to get their families together at the Ewell's Beach House in Pajaro Dunes. On the Thursday before Easter, Glee and Tiffany drove to the beach. Dale Ewell flew his plane up. Monica's parents, the Zents, drove down to join the Ewells. For the first time, the families were together. It was a festive evening. At dinner, when John Zent mentioned the glowing newspaper article he'd seen about Dana, Dale only nodded grimly. The Zents left the Ewell's house around midnight. Little did Dale, Glee, and Tiffany know what awaited them at their home in Fresno. Shortly before dawn on Easter Sunday, an intruder slipped into the Ewell home at 5663 East Park Circle Drive, carrying a backpack, a pager, and a plastic tarp. He moved purposefully from room to room, 
he spread the tarp over the floor, removed a 9mm assault rifle from his backpack, and assembled it. Then, the intruder waited patiently for hours, sitting on the plastic tarp so he wouldn't leave behind so much as an eyelash. He had one hand on his pager, waiting for the confirmation that the mission was a go. Tiffany walked through the door to the kitchen. She was killed instantly with one bullet to the back of the head. Glee heard the shot and made it as far as her office before being hit with a bullet fired at point blank range. An hour later, Dale Ewell arrived home to meet his wife and daughter. He made his way down the hallway. The gunman stepped out from behind Dale and fired his seventh and final bullet. Dale Ewell was killed instantly. An hour after the bodies were discovered, Dana Ewell was told that something horrible had happened to his family. He flew to Fresno and went directly to the sheriff's office. At that time, he was notified that his family had been, um, been killed. And his reaction to just totally blew me away. Do you know of any reason why anybody would want your family dead? Nothing, man. What about kids in the area? It's interesting that you ask that because it wasn't that long ago we, my family were talking and said, gee, you know, it seems like all the people on our block are just quacks. I mean, it is, the kids are turning out to be monsters. And family there was no sorrow or no emotions of any sort, and I'm, I thought, well, maybe, you know, he's in shock. The next day, detectives took Dana to the house and walked him through the crime scene. I kind of wanted to see how he was going to respond to the blood that was still visible in the house, and he just totally amazed me. The crime scene was horrific. There was blood everywhere. The police had cut crude holes in the walls to remove the bullets. They also had cut out and removed large sections of the blood-soaked carpeting. Dana stepped right over the spot where his mother had died without batting an eye. The only thing he cared about was who was going to pay for the damage to the house. For four days, detectives combed the Ewell house, trying to piece together what had happened. It didn't appear to be a professional job. There's junk piled on sheets, stuff pulled out of drawers, very amateurish, and nothing really gone. In fact, the only things missing from the Ewell home were Glee Ewell's pearl necklace and one of Dale's guns, a 9mm Browning pistol. Lying next to the empty pistol case was an open box of 9mm ammunition. There were no fingerprints, and no one in the neighborhood had seen anything suspicious. The closest they came to witnesses was when a few neighbors reported hearing a, a clanking, metallic clanking sound. Detectives also learned that the bullets recovered from the bodies were marked with very unusual scratches and striations. They concluded that the murder weapon must have been equipped with a silencer or sound suppressor. The next thing that caught their attention had nothing to do with forensics. Dana Ewell's behavior didn't make sense. At the funeral, he seemed unmoved. He greeted everybody and shook their hand and made comments about their jewelry and I just had a horrible sinking feeling that somebody that just lost their parents and their sister in a violent criminal act was showing no tears, no sadness, nothing. Getting the cheapest casket possible for Tiffany. Didn't even want to bother to put a $35 flower vase in his dad's headstone because he said he wouldn't be there anyway. Now, you can't convict a person for not crying at a funeral, but still, you can get some pretty good ideas. Something's wrong. Something else struck the detectives and the Ewell family as suspicious. Dana had moved back home, but he didn't clean up the evidence of murder. He said, you want to, you want to see the house? And it was, it was kind of macabre, but I mean, I was there. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I didn't, real, I didn't know what, was, what to expect. And then all of a sudden, I saw blood stains on the wall, and I just, I couldn't believe it. 
Four weeks into the investigation, Dana's uncles set up a meeting with the Fresno detectives. They described how Dana behaved at the reading of the will when he heard he would have to wait 14 years to inherit his parents' $8 million estate. Dana just exploded. He leaped out of his chair and pondered the table and just said, why would my dad do something like that? Why is this? Why is he cheating on her? Why am I getting my money? A visit from the Ewell brothers solidified Sousa's suspicions about Dana. He returned to the lab to examine the crime scene evidence. Forensic experts determined that Dale Ewell's missing pistol was not the murder weapon, but the bullets pulled from the bodies matched those found in the open box of ammunition in the Ewell house. This shooter have inside information that the ammunition was there, so he knew what caliber gun to bring. What person would bring an empty gun in hopes of finding ammunition in there to shoot him with? Only four people would have known that the ammunition was in the house, and three of them were dead. It was another piece of the puzzle pointing to Dana. The detectives had to eliminate Dana as the gunman, but Sousa figured Dana could have hired someone to do it for him. Fresno detectives traveled to Santa Clara University to learn more about their suspect. There, they discovered that Dana's closest friend at school was Joel Radisich. Sousa thought Joel might know something, even the smallest detail that would lead him to whoever Dana had hired. But when he called Joel at his mother's house, Joel gave him more than that. He goes, um, what are you going to do, arrest me? I go, and that obviously set me back. I'm going, wow, why would, why would you know, I'm thinking to myself, why would someone say something like that? The following day, Sousa and Curtis interviewed Joel at a nearby Holiday Inn. Joel said he and Dana didn't know each other well. Did you know Dana Yule? We weren't, I mean, we weren't really tight, but we were just friends. We liked to kick it together. Joel also told detectives he had an alibi. Um, Easter Sunday, what did you do? Easter Sunday, I was at um, Hamrick's, an auto body. But when the detectives checked Joel's alibi out, the owner of Hamrick's claimed he hadn't seen Joel at all on Easter Sunday. If Dana is involved, he didn't do it himself, he hired someone to do it, who would he hire? Well, I think Joel's first on the list. Catching Joel Radisich in a lie was child's play. But Detective Souza was after bigger game, and Dana Yule was going to be a lot harder to catch. A month into the investigation of the Yule family murder, detectives were publicly saying the case was still wide open. But their focus was strongly on Dana Yule, who stood to inherit $8 million. They felt he was the brains behind the brutal murder of his own family. More and more of the arrows are pointing at Dana, so now he's actually a prime suspect in this investigation. So if this kid did it, how am I going to prove it? Sousa suspected that Dana's best friend, Joel Radisich, might have pulled the trigger, but he needed to put the two together. Dana had to be tied very tightly to the shooter. That otherwise, there was no way to bring him in. And. Um, Luckily, he, he did not avoid Joel, nor did Joel avoid him. Danny Yule thought he was home free, but he didn't know the cops were on to him. In fact, he thought the cops were idiots. A friend of his told detectives that Dana referred to Detective Souza and his partner as Mutt and Jeff. The cops would never find out who killed my parents. That was his comment. Uh, only reason they're cops is because they weren't smart enough to get a better job. These are stupid statements to be making if you're guilty. Dana was so confident he had gotten away with it, he invited Joel to live with him. But Sousa had organized a surveillance detail on Dana and the Yule home. Undercover detectives frequently spotted Dana and Joel going in and out of banks together. A short time after the murders, Dana Yule began taking out cash from various accounts. And over the course of about three years, he took out 125,000 in cash. 
Dana was using some of the money to fund his and Joel's new expensive hobby, learning to fly helicopters. Hoping media pressure might lead his subjects to panic and make a mistake, Souza encouraged reporters to do a story on the Ewell case. For the first time, he leaked Dana and Joel's names as suspects. Dana shrugged it off, but Joel was scared. Well, as it turns out, that article chased Joel out of Fresno, sent him back to Los Angeles. The ploy had worked. Undercover agents began around-the-clock surveillance of Joel. Detectives followed Joel to Long Beach Airport. There, the unemployed college dropout was taking helicopter lessons, and he was paying for them in cash, nearly $500 an hour. The parents say they're not giving him money, then where is he getting? He's not working. Where's his source of income? Souza found his answer in Dana Ewell's financial records. Many of the withdrawals made by Dana coincided with cash payments made by Joel. It looked like Dana was bankrolling Joel or paying him off. What's with all the money going directly to Joel, the prime suspect in the, in the murders? How, does, how is that explained? It was very easy to believe, I think, for them that it was payment for services of some kind. With this solid financial link between their two suspects, detectives returned to Santa Clara University to dig up more information on Dana and Joel. They discovered that back in 1991, Joel had ordered how-to manuals on making silencers for guns. And we're going, holy. I go, you know, now, you know, we had those marks on the bullets. We didn't know where they were from. Now we got a guy who we suspect as possibly being the shooter now, buying books on how to make homemade silencers. This was a major break. Sousa was all but sure they had their shooter. His boss agreed to fund further surveillance of Joel. Agents also resumed watching Dana, who had returned to Santa Clara University. We discovered immediately that we could not follow Dana. Dana was, was always looking over his shoulder, but Joel was oblivious to the world around him. Thank God. He would be talking to people on the phone with an undercover officer standing next to him and loud enough to where that person could hear. On April 1st, 1993, Joel was overheard demanding money from the person on the other end of the phone. He's talking about going around the world and he needed 25, 25,000, he needed now, and this statement's like that. And I'm going, well, it'd be sure be nice to know who he's talking to. The detectives now had enough evidence to get a record of every number dialed from Joel's payphone. Sousa discovered that Joel was calling a phone booth in Santa Clara. Dana was in Santa Clara. Surveillance of Dana suggested that he was the one who was paging Joel, but detectives still had to prove it. To do this, Sousa made a shrewd move. He had a virtual duplicate or clone made of Joel's pager, so that every time Joel received a page, he received one as well. It was clear who Joel Radosich was talking to, that he was talking to Dana Ewell. And there were, there were even comments made uh, discussing the murders as that three-shirt deal. But as soon as Sousa established that Dana and Joel were communicating, officers overheard Joel say he thought he was being followed. Once they knew the heat was on them, once they knew they were being focused on, those close contacts stopped. Sousa had not a shred of physical evidence against Dana Ewell, but Sousa was smart. He decided to try and scare Dana into making a mistake. On May 12th, at around 8 p.m., Curtis and his partner made a surprise visit to Dana's dorm room. I remember we knocked on the door. We hear, who is it? And he opens up the door partway. And Dana's reaction is, what do you want? And he's starting to shut the door, and I say, by the way, Dana, we think Joel Ravsich killed your parents and your sister. And he stopped, and he looked, and he was, I, he, he was just white. He was transparent. Dana stormed out of his dorm room, jumped into his Mercedes, and sped away. Minutes later, Sousa's cloned pager went off. Joel was being paged to a telephone number in Santa Clara. 
So little things stacking up, circumstantial, yes, perhaps, but over the long haul, pretty damning in front of a jury. The investigation of the Ewell murders was going into its second year. There had never been a case in Fresno history as long or as expensive. Detective John Sousa was more determined than ever to bring the killer in. You have high profile, wealthy, connected people in a nice neighborhood killed. It's going to get more attention and probably the police are under more pressure to solve it. The Fresno Sheriff stayed on this case and gave Sousa all the resources he needed. Sousa's gut told him that he was on the right track, that Dana and Joel had done it, but he couldn't know for sure, and it tormented him. In this investigation, I woke up many times at night in a cold sweat, worried that I was crucifying this poor kid, and if he turns out to be innocent, how, how, how damaging that you know, would be. Sousa and Curtis spent months tracking down every possible lead. They crisscrossed the country and came up with little hard evidence. We knew Dana and Joel were dirty for this. We knew it, you know, but it was getting the proof, you know, or getting enough to make the DA believe in it enough to say, okay, we'll give you the warrants, go get them. On June 8th, 1993, Sousa and Curtis got their break. Undercover detectives listening in on Joel overheard him ordering an electronic lockpick. Joel had it sent to someone named Jack Ponce, a name detectives had not heard. Sousa and Curtis went to San Bernardino to check Ponce out. I mean, sitting there real cocky, another cocky college kid, you know, and I finally got him talking about the lockpick. And um, first he lied to us. Jack Ponce denied any association with Joel or any knowledge of the Yule killings, but the detectives didn't give up. We kept going back to Jack to talk to him. It was like pulling teeth, trying to get information out of this kid. But on one of the interviews, we had asked him about any guns he had owned, and he didn't lie about it. You mentioned that the 380. Let's go back to that. I'm the 380 was yours, the 22 was yours. Actually, uh, not the 22. He admitted to opening 44 pistol and rifles and shotguns and stuff. That got to a point where I asked him directly, have you ever owned a 9mm weapon? When he said yes, I, I felt, virtually felt like I fell out of the chair. Uh, I, it obviously excited me very much. Uh, because up to this point, you know, I really felt strong that he, he had a part in this. I didn't know exactly where. Now, the detectives needed to prove that at some point, Jack Ponce had given the gun to Joel. Now the questions are, well, do you have the gun? No. Do you know where the gun's at? No. Do you know who has a gun? No. You know, just, he would never volunteer anything. It just, you had to pry every answer out of him. Jack claimed he had never lent Joel the gun. The detectives figured the only way they were going to be able to prove that Jack Ponce's gun was the murder weapon was to build a new gun using the techniques they believed the murderer had used. First, detectives tracked down several gun barrels that came off the assembly line close to Ponce's. Back in the lab, ballistics experts used the handbook that Joel had ordered in 1991 to build a makeshift silencer. The instructions said to drill holes in the gun barrel and affix the silencer. They test fired the recreated gun. The homemade silencer changed the sound of the blast. Now we go back to our neighbors saying they heard noises, but it wasn't gunshots. It was clanging noises. Now we know what that sound was. The fired test bullets were identical to the bullets from the murder scene. When he drilled the barrels, he was leaving a burr on the inside of the barrel. So that's what made the marks, as it turns out. In January of 1995, Sousa and Curtis constructed a timeline stretching 100 feet long and color-coded each piece of evidence. And the timeline was invaluable because it would cause us to see how things related to each other that you wouldn't see otherwise. 
and it really told the story. The evidence was still circumstantial, but when added together, it presented a story with no loose ends, a story strong enough to take to court. Detectives could now link Dana to Joel, Joel to Jack Ponce, and Jack Ponce to the murder weapon. On March 2nd, 1995, arrest warrants were issued for Dana Ewell, Joel Radisich, and Jack Ponce. Dana Ewell and Joel Radisich were each charged with three counts of first-degree murder. If convicted, they could get the death penalty. Dana Ewell, Joel Radisich, Jack Ponce. The cops had a name for them, the Three Stooges. They used it as the file name on all the paperwork. Now Sousa was about to use one stooge against the other two. The DA asked Ponce if he wanted to cut a deal, and he did. He agreed to tell authorities everything he knew. When Jack Ponce knew he was actually being arrested on a warrant of three counts of murder, I really felt strong that he would come truthful, and he did. And he had a whole lot more than I thought he had. The high-profile trial began on December 16, 1997. The Yule triple homicide was the greatest crime story to hit the San Joaquin Valley in decades. This was the OJ case of Fresno. I mean, this was that big in Fresno. High-profile defense attorney Ernest Kinney stepped forward and offered to take the case for free. I've seen all the publicity. He's the spoiled rich kid. He's a jerk. And then as time went on and he contacted me and I looked at some of the evidence, it was so weak uh, that I started to realize that, you know, maybe this kid didn't do it. Ernest Kinney was a player in the O.J. Simpson trial. He was a friend of O.J.'s and did TV commentary. Kinney is a piece of work and he'll be the first one to tell you that he's the best criminal defense attorney in the state of California. Anytime there's a camera up, Ernie wants to be on it, and this was a big, high-profile case that was gonna get him notoriety. The prosecution began with the scene of the murders. They described the crime as an orchestrated hit. Next, they presented the assembled AT-9 assault rifle, fitted with a silencer, and the crucial ballistics evidence. The prosecution called 95 witnesses who presented the interlocking evidence they thought would convict Dana and Joel. But their star witness was Jack Ponce. On March 27, 1998, Ponce took the stand. From opening statements by both the prosecutor and especially Dana's defense lawyer, Ernie Kinney, I mean, Jack Ponce was gonna be the key. Ponce testified that a few days before the murders, he bought a 9mm assault rifle with money Joel gave him. Joel, he said, committed the murders to split the $8 million inheritance Dana expected to collect. The prosecution knew they couldn't rely on the jury believing Jack's testimony, so they stressed the close relationship between Dana and Joel. But it was all circumstantial. A bunch of garbage. But when you take it and you add it with motive, pretty soon the sinister Dana Yule had to be the one. Neither Dana Yule nor Joel Radisich testified in their own defense. After nearly five months, both sides rested. But for the jury, the real work was just beginning. I have a son the same age, and I didn't want to believe that uh, these two young men were capable of anything that they were being charged with. It was going to be tough for somebody to prove to me that these two young men were guilty. Every one of those 12 people wanted to acquit. They were parents, most of them. They were looking for reasons to acquit. The jurors created their own timeline with evidence they felt was incontrovertible. People would look at it and just sort of collapse, several of them into tears. They would just look at it and start crying because they couldn't pretend, they couldn't believe they were not guilty. On May 12, 1998, Dana Ewell and Joel Radisich were found guilty. 
One week after handing down guilty verdicts, the jury returned to the courtroom to decide if Dana and Joel would live or die. For three days, the jury struggled with the sentence. In the end, they deadlocked. The judge handed down the harshest punishment he could, life in prison without parole. Speaking out for the first time, Dana Ewell declared his love for his parents and his sister. I love my family with all my heart and soul. We were so very close and happy and content. I only wish that I could get up walk away from here, and my mother and my father and my sister would be waiting for me, and we, we could be together again forever. Dana, as he grew older, he lost his sense of right and wrong. He wanted what he wanted, irregardless of the price that other people might have to pay. In his mind, he didn't do it. He did nothing wrong. This was a business deal. He hired somebody to take care of a business deal, and they did it. The only thing that drives this kid was money. But Dana didn't get the money. The Ewell estate was turned over to other members of the family. Dana Ewell, this man with all this money, now sits with Charlie Manson, Juan Corona, Sirhan Sirhan, some of the worst, most villainous men known. If he's guilty, he more than deserves it. I don't think he is. We had no emotions, no reaction to the verdict. Uh, where I got a little emotional is how sad it was that Tiffany had Dana for a brother. Which got her killed. All for money. He wasn't happy with half of $8 million. He wanted all $8 million. Danny Ewell thought he was rich enough and smart enough to get away with murder, and he might have. The only thing was, he didn't figure on a detective who wouldn't give up. Now he'll spend the rest of his life in prison contemplating that mistake. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn.